So do follow us on our pages. Uh, and my name is Jackson Kinyanji. I'm the founder of Climate Change Kenya organization and I'm a climate uh, reality leader. Do follow us on our pages. That is on YouTube, you'll find us uh, at Climate Change Kenya. On Facebook, you'll find us at Climate Change Awareness Kenya. And on Twitter, you'll find us at Climate Kenya 254. Do subscribe to our channel. And uh, I think people have joined. You can see people online. And on top of that, I'm also the Nakuru County Youth Environmental Award winner. And I'm happy for those who are live joining me on this live podcast. To begin off, let me start off by going deep into the topic which will be basically trying to look into the impacts of greenhouse gases on our ozone layer and on top of that this topic has come at the right time because this week we'll be celebrating the world ozone day celebrations marking 35 years of ozone layer protection and the theme of this year's uh, world ozone day celebrations the theme will be ozone for life so the topic we'll be dwelling into, we'll be basically looking into what is this that we are trying, what is this that people have or need to, to understand more when it comes to uh, the impacts of greenhouse gases to our ozone layer? And what can you do to actually play your role or your part in elevating the problem of the pressure that we are putting on our ozone layer? To start, off, to start us off, these are the learning objectives. That is, we are going to describe the atmosphere and its layers. You'll be able to describe the ozone layer. You will be able to explain the different types of greenhouse gases. You'll be able to identify the different sources of greenhouse gases. And also, you'll be able to explain the effects of greenhouse gases and ozone depletion. Finally, you'll be able to explain the mitigation measures to combat the greenhouse gases. So to start off, I'll begin off by talking about the atmosphere and its layers. The atmosphere is composed of different types of gases. And these gases include, we have nitrogen, which is uh, occupying the largest, which is 78%. And then we have oxygen, which is taking about 21%. And finally, we have the remaining ones, which constitute uh, the remaining, that is uh, 1%, that is argon, we have the ozone, we have carbon dioxide, we have nitrogen dioxide, we have neon, we have helium, we have iodine, carbon monoxide, methane, ammonia, nitrous oxide, and water vapor. So we're going to look into all these gases and see which among these gases has man increased through his anthropogenic activities or through the naturogenic activities, that is the natural occurring activities, be it volcanic activities and all that. Because these gases, as much as we are saying man has had uh, the better hand on it, we also need to remember that natural factors or natural calamities are at play. The Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is composed of five layers. That is the troposphere. That is second one, that is tropo, uh, stratosphere. Troposphere basically means changing. And that's where we have all the weather phenomena taking place, including the weather activities, the clouds, the formation of the clouds. All these things happen in the troposphere. And it extends to a distance of uh, zero to 12 kilometers from the Earth's surface. We have the stratosphere, strato or strata meaning layers. This is where now we have different layers and the most important layer we have here we have is the ozone layer, followed by mesosphere, followed by thermosphere, and finally followed by exosphere. All these layers have different temperatures. They vary from hot to cold, all that. In troposphere, the higher you go, the cooler it becomes. In stratosphere, the different. The higher you go, the hotter it becomes, and then finally it, it goes like that, vice versa, until exosphere. Uh, I have indicated in that chart that where you can find where each and every kind of transport or mechanism where man can actually do their own kind of activities. 
We have air travel taking place between the uh, troposphere and stratosphere. We are having the orbits. We are having what we call the astronauts where they are, that is outside the exosphere and all that. The troposphere. The troposphere basically, as I've said earlier, it takes or it, it has a distance of zero to 12 kilometers from the Earth's surface, roughly around 12 to 16 kilometers. And what is the main characteristic of this layer? As I said earlier that this layer, the temperatures decrease as increase in height. And this is the layer where life exists. Why am I saying so? This way we have all these weather phenomena and uh, activities happening. 80% of the atmosphere is contained within the troposphere. That is how important the troposphere is to us. The second layer is the stratosphere. And the stratosphere, the temperatures in this layer, they increase with altitude. So here is, is the vice versa of the troposphere. So the temperatures increase as the altitude increases. And it occupies a distance of uh, 12 kilometers to 50 kilometers. That is above the troposphere. From the troposphere, you need to cover a distance of around 30 uh, to 40 kilometers for you to actually move out of the stratosphere. And the stratosphere is very, very important. And this is where we're going to dwell in in that the stratosphere is where we contain the ozone layer. The ozone layer is contained within the stratosphere. So this one tells you that the ozone layer is not that far from the Earth's surface, putting in mind that it starts from the troposphere. And the troposphere is only 12 to 16 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So if I was to measure the distance of the ozone layer from us, I would say it's roughly between 18 to 20 kilometers from the Earth's surface. The mesosphere is the third layer. And in the mesosphere, the temperatures in this layer, they decrease with the increase in height. It exhibits the same characteristics as the troposphere. And the temperatures at the mesosphere go as low as uh, 120 degrees centigrade. And here they are saying that the temperatures in the mesosphere decrease rapidly as there is no water vapor. There is no cloud, there is no dust or ozone to absorb the incoming radiation. Finally, we are having the thermosphere. The thermosphere extends upwards to altitudes of several hundred kilometers. And in this area, they are saying the temperatures depend on the degree of the solar activity. And remember, in this layer is where the temperatures changes between day and night, and temperatures increase with altitude. It has the same characteristic as the stratosphere. Remember, I say the troposphere has the same characteristic as the mesosphere, but the thermosphere has the same characteristics as the stratosphere. And last but not least is the exosphere. The exosphere is the fifth layer and is the outermost layer of the atmosphere. The temperature in the exosphere goes up with altitude. It increases with altitude. So it has the same characteristics uh, as the stratosphere and also it has the same characteristics uh, uh, with yeah with, it has the same characteristics with the stratosphere what do we notice about this satellites orbit in this space this is where the satellites orbit so we can see man has occupied all layers with all these technologies so this one might have a positive or a negative impact when it comes to the emissions that they emit the second area we need to look now into is the ozone layer. We have looked into the atmosphere, now we are going back into the stratosphere where we have now the ozone layer. That is a good picture that was taken from the Antarctica showing the extent of the ozone layer that up to date right now it has a, a radius, it has a diameter, it, it, it has an area covering of, of 8 million square kilometers. That's how wide it is. Location of the ozone layer. It is evident that it is found in the atmosphere, but more specifically, it is found in the stratosphere. It is the thinnest around the equator and denser at the poles. It can be found in smaller concentrations in troposphere where it is considered a pollutant or bad zone, ozone. So yes, it is found in the, in the stratosphere, but it extends into the troposphere. And that's where now we have 
the bad ozone. We'll discuss about the bad and the good ozone. Composition of the ozone layer. Basically, what is the ozone layer? The ozone layer, first and foremost, is composed of oxygen molecules. And more or less is composed of uh, three oxygen molecules, which you can see from uh, my right side of the presentation slide, how they are compact together. This gas is extremely rare in the atmosphere, representing just three out of every 10 million molecules. Three out of every 10 million molecules, we have the ozone. And this ozone is the one that ensures life is possible. Life exists on Earth. The ozone gas can be created or destroyed by the sun's ultraviolet rays. Good and bad ozone layer. What do you mean by this? When you talk about the good and bad ozone layer, the good ozone layer is found within the, st the stratosphere, while the bad ozone layer is found within the troposphere. The ozone that is found in the stratosphere, that is the good ozone, it absorbs the harmful ultraviolet rays from the sun. What about the bad one? The ozone found at the troposphere, which is the bad ozone, it is toxic and affects humans and plants on Earth. So there is that distinction between the good and the bad ozone layer. The good one protects the incoming uh, dangerous or harmful ultraviolet rays, while the bad ozone layer, it is one that affects or emits toxic uh, emissions or radiations back on Earth, affecting humans and plants. And it is found in the troposphere. What is the importance of the ozone layer? Basically, what is the importance of it? I want you to take a scenario of the ozone layer as a blanket covering me and you whenever it is cold. And I presume when it is cold, you take a blanket to cover yourself, to keep yourself warm. So this blanket is the same as the ozone layer. The more blankets you have, the more warmer you will be. Now take it into perspective that now you're outside where there is the sun and you have two blankets or three blankets on top of you. I presume you'll feel more heat and it will not be of benefit to you. So one of the benefits that we have is that the sun radiates its energy towards the earth. That it does on a daily basis. One form of this energy is the ultraviolet radiation. The ozone layer protects us from that. And in our subsequent slides, we'll see the effects of these ultraviolet radiations if the ozone layer was not there. The ultraviolet rays are relatively high energy waves that provide the Earth with warmth that it needs to support life. The UV rays penetrate the Earth's atmosphere at, uh, at three slightly different wavelengths called the UVA, UVB, and UVC rays. Let me give you a, good, a glimpse of what I mean by the ozone layer and how important it is to me and you. The distance of the sun to the moon is the same distance from the sun to the earth. But the temperatures on the moon are minus or negative 18 degrees centigrade. But the temperatures on earth are positive 18 degrees centigrade. What makes the temperatures on earth to become that favorable for man and plants is the ozone layer. The moon does not have an ozone layer. So that's why life is not possible on the moon and that's why the temperatures on the moon are much lower compared to that of, of the earth. The stratosphere or ozone layer completely stops the penetration of the ultraviolet rays and eliminates most of the dangerous UVB rays. Therefore, the ozone layer protects life on Earth from harmful effects of solar radiation on a daily basis. You can see that from that picture where we have, as I discussed earlier, we have the good ozone and the bad ozone. The good ozone, which is found in the stratosphere, helps to block these dangerous UV rays from entering the Earth's surface. The ozone layer depletion. In 1979, when the first ozone layer depletion was first detected, you can see how it was. The diameter has increased at the surface area ever since. And the biggest increase was in 2000. You can see it from there. Moving on up to 2014. That is the 
Antarctica. Because in the Arctic, as, as I will be explaining later, people will be having the questions like, does the ozone layer repair itself? Can it heal itself? The answer to that is yes. But a small no. Yes, because in the Arctic, the ozone layer, as it was reported by European Union, it was found that it had healed itself. It had healed itself from all those years of being depleted, but the Arctic one still remains, but it is projected by 2065. If we continue with this low carbon emission, then we expect the ozone layer depleted in the Antarctica to reduce. But we need to have some few measures for that to be possible. The ozone hole was first discovered in 1985. And it was considered as one of the centuries or one of these centuries major environmental disasters. Because the ozone layer being destroyed or being depleted, it has a ripple effect from climate, from diseases. We shall be looking at this in the subsequent slides. The land area under the ozone depleted atmosphere increased steadily to more than 20 million square kilometers in the early 1990s. Remember, after the Industrial Revolution, man decided, man increased their usage of fossil fuels. Transportation improved. That one led to the demand of fossil fuels. In 2008, the area of the ozone hole reached a record 29 million square kilometers. As I've said right now, that diameter has reduced. In the Antarctica, it is now at 18 million square kilometers. In 2010, a report found that over the past decade, global ozone and ozone in the, Antar in the Arctic and the Antarctica regions is no longer decreasing, but it is, but is not yet increasing. It's no longer decreasing, but it's not yet increasing. It was there. And then moving on, we can see that since 1928, that is after the Industrial Revolution, there was high usage of chlorofluorocarbons in 1928. After the First World War and the Second World War, chlorofluorocarbons were in high demand. They were being used in refrigerators. They were being used in dry cleaning agents, pesticides, and all these aerosols. The chlorofluorocarbons has, is the only gas that has the capability, among the other gases, of depleting the ozone layer. This led to the signing of the Montreal Protocol. I'll be discussing about it later in 1987-1989. That led to the restriction and the stoppage of the use of these chlorofluorocarbons. The ozone depleting process I've described it below here. You can see the first step, it happens to the ultraviolet radiation striking these chlorofluorocarbons emitted from all these refrigerators, aerosols. So once these chlorofluorocarbons are struck by this ultraviolet radiation, it causes a chlorine atom to break away from that chlorofluorocarbon. Remember the chlorofluorocarbon contains fluorine, chlorine, and this carbon atom. So once this chlorine is eliminated from this chlorofluorocarbon, the chlorine atom collides with an ozone molecule. Remember, the ozone molecule constituted three oxygen molecules. Once it goes and collides with these all three or the oxygen, uh, ozone molecules, it steals or it takes away one uh, oxygen molecule. When a free atom of oxygen collides with the uh, chlorine uh, mono monoxide, the two oxygen atoms form a molecule of oxygen. The chlorine atom is released and free to continue its destruction path of breaking the three bonds of oxygen. And once you break those three bonds of oxygen, it is no longer an ozone. It now becomes free flowing oxygen. And that one cre creates that depletion and that hole that I showed you earlier in the ozone, uh, in the stratosphere that is in the ozone layer. Now it means that the dangerous harmful UV rays will now have a path and directly move and enter into the Earth's surface. The effects are catastrophic, as I will mention to you as we move on. Now, 
Greenhouse gas, what is it? What's the greenhouse gas we're talking about? Greenhouse gas is any gas that accumulates lower energy infrared radiation. These gases consist of, we have water vapor, carbon dioxide, we have methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons. As much as chlorofluorocarbons were banished or they were banned from the signing of the Montreal Protocol in 1987-1989, let me just put it there because there are traces of chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere. Water vapor. People might be asking, why are you putting water vapor as a greenhouse gas? Yes, it is. I've categorized both good and bad greenhouse gases. Water vapor is produced by the sun's heat emission. It makes up a maximum of 45, 4% of, uh, of the air. It causes about two thirds of the greenhouse effect. Two thirds of the greenhouse effect is caused by this water vapor. Higher temperatures equals more water vapor. That is a feedback loop. From the left of my slide, from the right side of my slide, you'll be able to see that is one example of a hydrological cycle. And it will not be possible if it was not, uh, the sun was not there so that the heating process can occur, it evaporates, it forms the water vapor, it condenses and goes back. These clouds help to reduce the solar radiation that will be entered into the earth. So yes, the water vapor is part of that greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide. Both man-made and naturally produced. Carbon dioxide can either be man-made, is man-made produced and naturally produced by plants, by animals, when we exhale outside, when we exhale carbon dioxide, when we take in oxygen. It is naturally produced from industry, from combustion, it is produced from uh, burning uh, of, of, of wood, charcoal, and all that. It accounts for 385 parts per million of the atmosphere. It is the largest, but it is not the most potent. Responsible for about 25% of the natural greenhouse effect. And lastly, carbon sink help to remove the CO2 emissions. And that's why we advocate for planting of trees good agricultural activities we should reduce what we call paving of these garden or soil areas because the soil acts as a carbon sink so when you put all these carbons and you cement all these soil areas then you have blocked the pathways of these carbon sinks so as much as we're talking about development it has an effect if we don't look into this kind of measures that's why we need to embrace a circular economy as opposed to the traditional linear economy methane methane let me just start off by saying that carbon methane is four times potent in fact the scientists usually say it is 40 times potent than carbon four oxide it is 40 times dangerous than carbon four oxide but in terms of uh, quantity carbon four oxide takes the cup so methane as i've said earlier it is 40 times potent than carbon dioxide. it is produced by both human and natural sources less quantities of methane in the atmosphere are present compared to carbon dioxide. methane molecules are capable of absorbing thermal energy 40 times more than carbon four oxide molecules which are the sources of methane as you can see from the right side of my slide, is that biological sources, decomposition of these landfills, non-biological sources, that is volcanic activities, chemical degradation, and microbial uh, consumption. Nitrous oxide, produced naturally by human sources. Lower density in atmosphere than carbon dioxide. The molecules are 300 times more effective as greenhouse gas than a CO2 molecule. So if you're categorizing them in terms of being more dangerous or how potent they are, then the list will be carbon dioxide followed by methane, then nitrous oxide. But in terms of quantity, it is a carbon dioxide. Where is it produced from? Automobiles, from fertilizers, 
from industries. And this is what leads to acidic rainfall. If you see the roofs are corroded, that's an effect of this acidic rain. The ozone, as I said earlier, it exists, it exists naturally. It creates the layer protecting the earth and it acts as a greenhouse gas in the troposphere. It is a greenhouse gas, the ozone, because it is composed of these three oxygen molecules. It is a gas in itself. And this is one gas that protects us. And as I said earlier, we have the good ozone and the bad ozone, depending with where it is. Which are these sources of greenhouse gases? I've categorized them in terms of effects from the highest 60% from the lowest 1%. Carbon dioxide takes the lead with having an effect of 60% on the climate. The sources are burning fossil fuels, deforestation, and also from vehicles and all that. The second one is hydrofluorocarbons taking 16%. It accounts for 16% of the effects of the climate that we have. The sources are aerosols and refrigerants. Methane takes 15%. It, 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 it affects 15% and it causes 15% of that climate effect. The sources are organic waste, cattle, fuel production. Nitrous oxide accounts for 5% of the effects of the climate. Sources are fertilizers, soil, and fuels. And that's why we advocate for organic fertilizers. 2% is from the... Uh, uh, Parfluorocarbons, it comes from the paint, textile, aluminum production. And I've seen people coming up with eco-friendly paint colors. That's what you should be buying or advocating for. 1% is the sulfur hexafluoride. It comes from electrical industry, the rubber and magnesium production. And lastly, we have in 1%, being composed of water vapor. So yes, water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but the effect is so minimal to the climate. And it comes from irrigation, from evaporation, from ice melting. What are the effects of these greenhouse gases to the atmosphere or to the earth? So this is a picture showing the sun radiating its solar radiation. The ozone layer is there, reflecting some of it back, allowing the good solar radiation, the UV rays, to come in. Because plants require the solar radiation for growth and photosynthesis. We as humans require it. Remember, we have solar panels. Remember, we have all these things that require the good solar radiation. Some of it escapes after it hits the ground. It escapes back into the atmosphere. But with the compounding effect of greenhouse gases from deforestation, from the chlorofluorocarbons, that is the aerosols, from the cars using fossil fuels, from industries, it creates another blanket. And the blanket now acts as an insulator. The radiation that could have been reflected from the earth's surface and back into the atmosphere is now reflected back into the, into the earth leading to the increase in the earth's surface temperatures. And remember, we are working as hard to attain the limits of temperatures below the 1.5 degrees centigrade. But with these greenhouse gases being emitted, then I don't see that being a possibility. What are some of these effects that we have in terms of the effects of greenhouse gases? I've said the first one is greenhouse effect. That is the warming of the earth surface. The second one is the sea level rise. Sea level rise has been an effect that has been affecting all countries globally. From Africa, Kenya, we are having Kenya's and we're having problem of flooding in Kenya from the Rift Valley lakes. From Sudan, just recently Sudan issued a climate crisis. They had a three, they issued a three month uh, climate crisis due to the floods that have killed over 100 people and destroyed over, displaced over 10,000 people. 
sea level rise is an effect of these greenhouse gases that have led to the increase of surface temperatures, that have led to the melting of the ice, that have increased the sea level rises, and also remember it has also led to, uh, to the boosting and the magnification of the hydrological cycle. It's as if the hydrological cycle is working on steroids. It is more potent than it was because of these greenhouse gases that have led to the surface temperatures increasing. Melting of ice, this is something that has been out there due to this ozone layer being depleted, leading to the ultraviolet rays and more solar radiation penetrating, and especially in the poles, because these gases rise. And where they usually head is the poles. And that's why you see the poles have the huge effect. Tem now, temperatures in the poles are now higher as compared to the tropics. Destruction of the ozone layer is the fourth effect of greenhouse effect, or the greenhouse gases. And you, as you can see, from 1979 to 2019, the ozone layer has been increasing, but as from 2016, it has been reducing, especially in the Arctic. In the Arctic, it has healed itself. In the Antarctic, also, it is healing itself. Some people can say it's because of this COVID scenario where now we don't have so much air travel, not so much air pollution. This is something that is up for debate. Drought and desertification is the fifth effect of greenhouse gases. Temperatures increasing, areas that were having high temperatures, they now, they now become much more hotter and all that. So it, it leads to desertification and drought. It leads to farming as an effect of this drought and desertification. Farming is evident and reduced plant yields. And this one tells you that now we are going to have an effect or a certain effect of more people dying because of hunger and all that just because we could not control our urge of you of releasing these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Let us now go to the effects. The effects of depletion of the ozone layer. The first one is skin cancer. Remember these dangerous UV rays, they bring in these rays that are not beneficial to me and you and the plants, and they tamper with the genetic mechanism of each and every organism on Earth. Skin cancer is one of these resultant effects. And this can explain why we, ha we are having more uh, cases of cancer-related diseases in Africa and in the world in general. And the effect is this and maybe some people can say that the countries that emit the most greenhouse gases and the countries that do not emit the most the effect is the same so we need to be all hands on board and play our role and not say that those who are emitting the most they need to play the bigger role no we need to all pull our power socks and play the role the same because you only have one earth we don't have any other planet B. The other effect is eye cataracts. The eye cataracts is an effect that leads to the cloudiness of the pupil. This comes about from the emission, from that entrance of that dangerous UV rays that is not beneficial even to the eyes. So the cloudiness of the eyes is the resultant effect of that. And that's this is something that we have seen happening Cases have been increasing worldwide, especially in Africa. And this one tells you that the greenhouse gases are present. The ozone layer is depleting or it was depleted. And these are the effects we are feeling, the ripple effects we are feeling. Climate change is the other effect of uh, this ozone layer depletion and all that. It leads to these climate change phenomena being exhibited, the increase from the wildfires. We saw them in the Amazon forest. In USA, they were there. Droughts, drastic droughts 
hurricanes, category five kind of hurricanes happening all over the world. So these are some of the effects that occur due to this ozone layer being depleted. Sunburns, these are some that are more evident. As much as in Africa, the sunburns, most of you cannot feel it because of our melanin, which has that dark pigmentation, but the sunburn effect is present. This is as a result of the extra solar radiation, which is now penetrating into the Earth's surface, of which much of it is dangerous. The other one is the reduced fish yields. Some people can be asking, how do fish now come into play into the ozone layer being depleted and their yields reduced? Remember, these are aquatic animals. And being aquatic, it means that they rely on 100% of their life is basically underwater. This one tells you that once the water heats up due to the effect of the solar radiation penetrating to that surface, the water becomes warm. And remember, these fish require a certain amount of temperature for them to actually produce and to increase in yield and in growth and in size. So yes, once the temperatures increase, and remember some of these greenhouse gases, that we talked about the nitrous uh, oxide, it leads to the formation of acidic rain. So once this falls on the water, it leads to lowering the pH in the water. And finally, the fish will have to go extinct because of the acidification of these waters where they're living. Their habitat has been destroyed, temperature-wise and pH-wise. Crop and forest damage, we have seen the wildfires happening everywhere in the world. The increase in temperatures lead to what we call wildfires happening and being more prominent globally. So yes, the ozone layer has been depleted. And yes, the greenhouse gases are there. And they have led to surface temperatures on Earth increasing. And this is the resultant effect. Extinction of animals. And I have a chart here explaining to you which animals are more, which animals have been grouped into the level of risk, extinction risk from climate change as a result of this ozone depletion and greenhouse gases. The first one is the amphibia, amphibians taking 12.9%, followed by reptiles, a risk extinction of 9%, invertebrates 8.9, 8.8, mammals 8.6, the fish. 7.6, plants 7.3, birds 6.3. So in overall, all these plants and animals, the level of extinction is 7.9%. And some of them have already been extinct up to date. Continental-wise, you can see which regions will be hit the hardest. 23% South America, 13% Australia, 12% will be happening in the oceans, 11% in Africa, 9% in Asia, 6% in Europe, and finally 5% in North America. How to reduce the greenhouse gases and ozone depletion? What can you and me do? What measures can we do? Because that is a question people are asking. That is a million dollar question we are asking ourselves. What role can I play? As opposed to the government playing its own role and all these nations and all these treaties, what can you do at your own personal level? The first one is turning off the lights when you leave the room. And I put one slogan on my right on the slide is that if you are the last one out, turn off the lights. How do lights come into play? Lights come into play because once we use more light, we put more pressure on electricity. Remember these electricities are generated by various industries. And some of them rely on fossil fuels, on diesel and all that. 
and also the bulb itself emits carbon so all this if you now you are able to monitor your power usage then you'll be playing a bigger role in reducing your emissions these are some of the indoor air pollutions that we're talking about number two we need to talk about reduce reuse and recycle and here i'm talking about we need to embrace the cyclic economy as opposed to the traditional linear economy the cyclic economy embraces recycling reu reu reusing and also reducing your wastes remember these greenhouse gases come from landfills where we dispose of our wastes if we are able to embrace recycling then the landfills will not be having anything for them to emit the methane and other potent greenhouse gases. The traditional linear economy I'm talking about is where we used to produce things, we use it and we dispose of it. But now we need to embrace the cyclic economy where once we produce something, you need to use it and reuse it so that now it remains more in the cycle. The third way you can play a role or in reducing these greenhouse gases is choosing natural gas over coal and oil. Coal and oil, these are some of the emitters of these greenhouse gases we're talking about. But once you embrace natural gas, be it biogas and other natural gases, then you'd be playing a huge role in reducing the emissions to the environment. Buying a hybrid or electric car, fossil fuel car. Here I'm talking about if you're not able to cycle, if you're not able to walk, and you think and you believe you need a car, please go for the hybrid ones or the electrically charged cars. You'll be playing a huge role in reducing the emissions from the fossil fuels. Once we reduce the demand on fossil fuels, then all these factories will have to lock down and pack up and create more jobs which are geared towards the green economy. Number five, walk or cycle to work instead of driving. Most people might not agree with me on this, but this is the path we need to follow. We need to embrace walking and cycling to work instead of driving. Some people might be having the perspective like driving is prestigious, driving elevates you to a certain status, but no, at what cost? Cycle or walk to work. In Sweden, they have created this good channel whereby all their roads network. 60% or 50% of that road transport network is allocated for people to walk, for walkways, and bicycle lanes but in africa it's a vice versa most of these transport networks 90 percent is allocated for vehicles and even in some countries there are no pathways for walking and bicycle lanes in fact in africa it's more dangerous to ride a bicycle and walking as opposed to driving because the vehicle owners or these drivers they do not respect this bicycle uh, who, are driving, who are riding the bicycles or walking. So it's easy for you to be knocked down. But this can be changed by creating policies and the transport ministry creating pathways and, and, and the regulations and strict laws that protect these people who are ready to protect the ozone layer and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by walking and cycling to work. The other one is afforestation and reforestation activities. By increasing our afforestation, reforestation activities, then we increase our carbon sinks. And these trees are, have the capacity of sequestering or absorbing all this carbon in the atmosphere that is part of the greenhouse gas menace. And remember, part of the COP agreement is that we need to increase our tree cover generally in the globe by 10 percent each country needs to increase their tree cover by 10 percent and remember in the signing of that treaty 
it made every country to have their nationally determined contributions, which were part of the low carbon emission kind of policy that aimed at reducing our carbon emissions by planting more trees, by embracing green economy, by embracing clean renewable energy. Number seven, use eco-friendly household cleaning agents that do not produce all these nitrous oxides and all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Avoid excessive use of pesticides. That's a warning. Pesticides contribute to the greenhouse gases. We need to avoid this. We need to use biological kind of pesticides as opposed to these natural pesticides. Let's use the natural mechanisms that are there to reduce the pests. Biological control is better as opposed to the chemical control mechanism. Buy air conditioning and refrigeration equipment that do not contain the hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Which I said, the chlorofluorocarbons are the ones that are responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer. All the other gases are responsible for the greenhouse effect, but the chlorofluorocarbons are responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer. And with that marks the end, let me give you some facts about the ozone layer that we need to have at our fingertips. The first one is the ozone layer. Did you know the ozone layer is a molecule with a strong smell and it is blue in color? And that's why maybe when you look up the sky, you see the sky is blue. That is the color of the ozone layer. Some people can say it's the reflection of the water bodies. I beg to agree or to differ, but it's all the same. The ozone layer is blue in color. The ozone layer was discovered by Charles Fabry and Henry Brisson and French physicists in 1913. That is after the First World War. The ozone layer is able to absorb up to 98% of the sun's UV light. That's how important the ozone layer is. The signing of the Montreal Protocol in 1987-1989, it put in place measures to stop the wider use and production of these chloro, uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Five, the ozone layer is 12 to 20 miles above the Earth's surface. I said it is found in the, in the stratosphere and part of it is found in the troposphere. The one found in the troposphere is the one that we call the bad ozone layer, and the one found in the stratosphere is the good ozone layer. In the First World War, ozone was used to treat uh, gingerine and, and trench foot and to disinfect wounds. The hole in the ozone layer was discovered above the Antarctic in 1985. Number eight, did you know that if people stop producing ozone, destroying substances, the ozone layer may be capable of recovering by 2050. This is the case of the Antarctic ozone layer. Number nine, some countries have banned the use of chlorofluorocarbons, aerosols, sprays altogether, such as Canada, Norway, and the US. Other applications of chlorofluorocarbons were still allowed. However, there are some countries that have not enforced this rule up to now. The question and answer session. If you have a question, post it in the live chat. As you do that, I have a few questions for you. The first question is, which of the following is not the consequence of ozone layer depletion? Which of the following is not the consequence of ozone layer depletion. We have looked into this as we were discussing. Which one is not a consequence of ozone layer depletion? Number one, we have increased ultraviolet rays, it is. Malignant melanoma, another form of skin cancer, it is a consequence of ozone layer depletion. Cyanobacteria are sensitive to UV radiation and would be affected by its increase, true. Tides, tides are not consequences of ozone layer depletion, they are not. These ones are consequences of greenhouse gases or greenhouse effect that leads to the increase of temperatures and then the tides will increase. But it is not a consequence of ozone layer depletion. The other one is why UV radiation is higher in summer. 
The answer is A, that is the sun is closer to planet Earth. So UV rays have a shorter distance to travel to reach us. The third one, which product contains ozone depleting substances? Which substance, which products contain ozone depleting substances? Here we're talking about motorbikes releasing carbon. True, they have car with ACs, sprays, the aerosols, ovens, if they are using uh, the CFCs, refrigerators, if they're using the CFCs, pesticides, fire extinguishers, carbon monoxide. So yes, majority of them they have. That is all of them they have, apart from the uh, apart from a few. That is uh, the case of uh, the ovens, if they are not using the chlorofluorocarbons and the fire extinguishers. Number four, when was the first ozone hole discovered? It was discovered in the 1970s. That is when it was discovered in 1970s. In which sphere ozone layer depletion is found? Ozone layer depletion is found in the stratosphere. In the stratosphere. Six, depletion in the ozone layer is caused by, I said earlier it is caused by the chlorofluorocarbon. Yes, the other gases contribute to the greenhouse gases, but the one that is responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer is the chlorofluorocarbon. D. Number seven, which of the following is a prime health risk associated with greater UV radiation through the atmosphere due to depletion of ozone layer? The answer is increased skin cancer. That is the leading problem that we have in terms of the ozone layer being depleted and the dangerous UV entering into, the, into our atmosphere. But eight, the Montreal Protocol is related to what? Is it related to global warming, to ozone layer depletion, sustainable development, food security? Yes, you're right. It is related to ozone layer depletion. It was signed in 1987-1989, putting an end to the production and the usage of chlorofluorocarbons, which are the main reasons why the ozone layer is being depleted. Number nine, an ozone depleting substance mainly used is which one? It is D, that is cooling and refrigeration applications and in the manufacture of foam production. Burn, burning fossil fuels, that is carbon. Chimneys, carbon. All human activities, we are having methane, we are having nitrous oxide and all that. But the cooling and refrigeration application is where we have the CFCs. So when you're shopping for these air conditioners and uh, refrigeration uh, machineries, please look into whether they use these chlorofluorocarbons, if they are eco-friendly or not. But then, the CFCs or the chlorofluorocarbons are greenhouse gases that have caused a rise of three degrees centigrade in the global temperatures in the past century. Name the CFC that is used in refrigerators. In refrigerators, yes, we know it is a chlorofluorocarbon, but which chlorofluorocarbon is found in refrigerators? The answer is D, that, that is freon. Freon is the gas that is found in refrigerators and it is part of the chloro chlorocarbons. That marks the end of my presentation. And maybe to take you back to just summarize and say one or two words is that we need to put more emphasis on going green and using green energy because that has been the challenge. As much as you are saying green energy is clean energy, we need to put it into work, we need to put it into words, we need to put it into paper and to enforce it. Don't wait for your country, don't wait for these leaders to play their part on our behalf. No, you can do it at your own level. And with that, I want to say thank you for joining me. My name is Jackson Kinyanjui. I am the founder of Climate Change Kenya. I am a climate reality leader. And 
to follow more on this webinar, please go to our website, go to our YouTube channel, and you'll be able to see more of this. Thank you so much for joining me, and thank you for tuning in. And with that, I want to say goodbye. Remember to subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for listening, and God bless you.